My name is Ezra Yates, and this happened to me in October of 2010. I spent most of my life working as a ranger in various national parks, but my heart belonged to the rugged forests and mountains of the Pacific Northwest. I was nearing retirement, looking forward to some peace and quiet, when I got assigned a rotation in the Cascade Range. Little did I know, my final years in service would be anything but peaceful. The station I got assigned to was a remote one, miles from the nearest paved road. I liked the solitude. I'd been divorced for decades, and the only company I craved was the company of trees. I settled in, filled my days with routine patrols and trail maintenance. Most evenings it was just me, the crackling fire in the station fireplace, and a mug of steaming coffee. It should have been paradise. The trouble started with the livestock kills. I first came across one during a boundary inspection, a mauled carcass on the edge of a rancher's property bordering the park. No sign of what did it. Too vicious for a wolf, too calculated for a bear. This wasn't my first rodeo. Things die messy ways out in the wild. I logged it with the local sheriff, figuring it was a one-off thing. A week later, I found another mangled carcass deeper into park territory. Then another, and another. The higher-ups blamed rogue cougars, but I'd seen cougar kills before. This was different. Deep down, a sense of foreboding started to gnaw at me. Then came the disappearances. A lone hiker vanished on a popular trail. Search and rescue found only scraps of his backpack and a smear of blood against a tree. A pair of experienced campers, their tent torn apart in the night, leaving no trace but a haunting silence. The official line was accidents, misfortune, or that they'd run off without telling anyone. But folks were getting scared, and soon I was the only one venturing into those woods. I was on a supply run to the nearest town when I met Evie. She ran a small bait-and-tackle shop and was a fount of local knowledge. While I scanned the shelves for provisions, I overheard Evie arguing with some gruff-looking hunters. The men were convinced something monstrous lurked in the forest, something responsible for the disappearances. Evie scoffed, but there was a hint of fear in her eyes. She caught me listening, and after the hunters left I introduced myself. Turns out, the stories had been circulating for years. Whispers from the old-timers about sightings in the high country, a towering shadow that wasn't a bear, glowing eyes in the darkness. I was skeptical, but Evie swore it was more than just local superstition. She'd heard the same rumors from indigenous communities going back centuries. Something about a forest spirit, a protector, or maybe something far darker. Either way, that uneasy feeling in my gut twisted tighter. Armed with a resupply of ammo and a renewed determination, I headed back to the ranger station. I started noticing the eyes soon after, two pinpricks of malevolent light flickering in the tree line whenever I ventured out at night. The hair on the back of my neck stood on end. I'd see a flash of movement in the underbrush, branches snapping just out of sight. It followed me on patrols, a constant presence I couldn't ignore. My nights became restless and filled with nightmares where I was the hunted the thing in the darkness closing in. Finally, it made its move. I was returning from a long day on the trail when I saw the carnage. The ranger station, my sanctuary, had been reduced to a smoking ruin. Torn logs were scattered like toothpicks, and a sickly sweet odor clung to the air. I found no remains, just splatters of blood that led into the woods. Panic surged through me, the realization hitting with the force of a sledgehammer. Whatever lurked out there, it was intelligent and tactical, and it wanted me to know. I ran, ran deeper into the forest, driven by desperation. The thing was toying with me, leading me into the heart of its territory. I'd glimpse it sometimes, perched on a ridge like a grotesque bird of prey. It was almost humanoid, but impossibly tall and skeletal. Its skin had a mottled, bark-like texture, blending it with the trees. But it was those eyes that haunted my waking moments, twin orbs of pure, predatory hunger. I tripped over a gnarled tree root, my rifle tumbling end over end into the darkness. A throaty growl echoed behind me. Turning, I saw the creature lunge from the shadows. My hands found my sidearm. I aimed, fired, and squeezed the trigger until the gun clicked empty. 
The creature let out a piercing shriek and staggered backward, clutching at a wound. I scrambled for more ammo, my fingers clumsy with terror. It hissed with rage, its eyes blazing. Then it melted back into the forest, leaving me with a silence far more terrifying than any roar. The adrenaline coursing through me wouldn't let me stay still. I reloaded, my hands shaking, and moved deeper into the woods. It was a desperate gamble, but I needed distance. Needed to find help, warn someone, anyone. Stumbling blindly, I half walked, half ran through the night, the forest a swirling blur of shadows and half-glimpsed shapes. Each rustle of leaves made me jump, the darkness twisting every tree into a monstrous silhouette. I don't know how long I ran. Finally, just before dawn, I stumbled into a clearing and collapsed, gasping for breath. A narrow dirt road snaked its way across the open ground. Salvation. If I could just make it to that road, I could flag down a car, send for backup. Then I froze. Because standing on the far side of the clearing, outlined by the first light of dawn, was the creature. It crouched low, sniffing the air like a hunting dog. When those eyes fixed on me, a desperate sob escaped my lips. It knew I was here. There was no escape. We stood like that for an agonizing moment, predator and prey sizing each other up. I reached for my sidearm, cursing myself for leaving the rifle behind. The pistol felt like a pathetically inadequate defense. Yet somehow, looking at the creature in the cold light of day, some of the terror ebbed away. It wasn't supernatural, not demonic. It was flesh and blood, just warped, twisted into a horrifying form. Fear gave way to a strange sense of clarity. It was the final showdown, right here, right now. And I wasn't going down without a fight. I raised my pistol and fired. The creature let out a roar of fury and charged. I squeezed off shot after shot, emptying the magazine in a desperate fusillade. It staggered, and I saw dark stains bloom across its bark-like skin. But it kept coming, its gait uneven but relentless. Out of ammo, I flung the useless pistol away and grabbed a hefty fallen branch. Madness, probably. But I was past logic, running on sheer survival instinct. The creature lunged, its claws flashing. I swung the branch, connecting with a sickening crunch. Bone shattered and a spray of viscous fluid hit my face. The creature howled in pain, rearing back in surprise as I scrambled for another fallen branch. I rained blow after blow upon its long limbs, each strike driving it further back. It snarled in rage, then turned and crashed back into the forest, vanishing as quickly as it had appeared. I stumbled to the side of the road, sinking to my knees. I was bloody, bruised, and the adrenaline was finally wearing off, leaving me shaking and close to collapse. But I was alive. Sometime later, a truck came rattling past. The elderly rancher driving it nearly swerved off the road at the sight of me. I mumbled some garbled explanation, barely able to form coherent sentences. He got me to the nearest hospital, to the raised eyebrows and the skeptical glances of the medical staff. My official statement painted a picture of a bear attack, of hallucinations caused by shock and dehydration. And yes, the wounds they stitched probably could have come from a bear encounter. But as I lay in that sterile hospital bed, I stared at the ceiling and knew what I'd faced wasn't any animal on the books. I couldn't shake the image of those eyes, that chilling intelligence that burned through the bestial form. They offered the usual, counseling extended leave. I knew what they were implying. PTSD, or early senility setting in. I took my mandatory leave and resigned a week later. Couldn't face those woods, those mountains, ever again. I drifted for a while, finding odd jobs in towns and cities, always looking over my shoulder. Then I heard a whisper of a rumor, something about another spate of disappearances on the Canadian border. Something about a creature. My battered old truck became my home. I packed it with supplies, with what was left of my ranger gear, and with a grim determination. I spent the next few years driving logging roads, scanning remote trailheads, a grizzled old man with a haunted look in his eyes. Evie was right. The stories were true, and something had to be done. Sometimes in the dead of night I wake up in a cold sweat and see two glowing orbs peering at me through my truck window, but I'm ready for it now. I keep a loaded shotgun under my bunk and an old hunting knife honed to a razor's edge. The creature, or whatever it is, hasn't shown its face again. Maybe it's wary now, 
or maybe it's just biding its time. I don't often see my reflection these days, but when I do, I see a stranger staring back at me, a man forged in the shadows, his heart as gnarled and twisted as those ancient trees. It wasn't the retirement I'd envisioned, this solitary hunt under a moonlit sky, but it's the only one I've got. The woods were once my sanctuary, a place of peace. Now they're a battlefield, and out there, somewhere in the deep, dark places, the creature waits. And so do I. My name is Jonah Martin, and this happened to me in August of 2007. Been a ranger in Yosemite National Park since I could walk. It's my backyard, a place I know like the back of my hand. The smell of pine sap, the feel of granite beneath my boots, the familiar squawk of ravens circling Half Dome. Or at least I thought I knew it. I was nearing retirement, looking forward to long, lazy mornings on my cabin porch instead of dawn patrols and scolding tourists. Then it started. The first report was from a scrappy trio of backpackers, flushed with sunburn and youthful audacity. They swore they'd seen something enormous moving near their campsite, disappearing into the dense forest at the edge of the valley. They told their story with wide eyes and hushed whispers, the classic signs of an overactive imagination fueled by too many nights under the stars. I smiled, gave them some safety tips, and chalked it up to inexperience. Then came more reports. A harried family swore something had circled their minivan at night, describing unnervingly human eyes gleaming out of the darkness. A seasoned hiker, a man known for his no-nonsense attitude, filed a report of a mangled deer carcass, its rib cage torn open in a disturbingly unnatural way. Something was stirring in the shadows of Yosemite, something that defied easy explanations. The higher-ups predictably downplayed it. Bear activity poachers, the usual attempts to confine the wilderness within familiar categories. Those of us on the ground, though, we knew different. We kept a closer eye on the woods, our senses constantly on alert. There was a tension in the air, a sense that the old balance had shifted. I took fewer solo shifts, an unspoken but necessary precaution. It should have been a simple supply run, a routine trip into the neighboring town to replenish our stock of trail maps and bug spray. That's when I saw the Turner family, Emily, her husband Peter, and their six-year-old daughter, Maya. They were the picture-perfect embodiment of an outdoor vacation, matching backpacks, neatly pressed hiking clothes, and Maya clutching a worn, stuffed rabbit. I stopped to chat, offering directions and a friendly warning about the heat. Maya hid behind her mother's legs, staring at me with wide eyes, unnervingly serious for a child her age. There are monsters in the woods, she said in a small, solemn voice. The words hung in the air, a jolt of dread in the sunny afternoon. Don't scare the ranger, honey, Emily chided, ruffling her daughter's hair with a nervous laugh. Peter looked uneasy, the forced cheer of their vacation faltering. I gave Maya a reassuring smile, but I couldn't shake the memory of her eyes, dark and filled with an unsettling certainty. Later that week, the Turner family vanished. Their campsite was found abandoned, their tent slashed and belongings scattered as if some large animal had ripped through it. A frantic search yielded nothing but a single, chilling find. Maya's stuffed rabbit, torn and muddied, lying at the edge of the tree line. The official explanation was predictable. They must have wandered off trail, gotten lost, maybe even met with foul play from a fellow hiker. Unofficially, a cold fear spread through the rangers. We knew they hadn't simply gotten lost. Something was out there, something that targeted families and lured children into the darkness. Armed and accompanied by a tight-knit crew that included my old friend and fellow ranger Elena, I ventured deeper into the forest than we ever had before. Elena was tough, with a wiry frame and a sharp wit that belied her kind heart. We'd been through a lot together, and I'd followed her lead, and vice versa, more times than I could count. The deeper we went, the more the forest seemed to change. The sunlight barely penetrated the thick canopy overhead, casting the woods in a perpetual gloom. The usual bird song was replaced by an oppressive silence. We pushed on, driven by a grim sense of duty and the chilling knowledge that with each step, we were venturing out of familiar territory and into the hunter's domain. 
Then we heard it. A low, guttural growl that echoed through the trees, sending a shiver down my spine. We froze, rifles raised, our senses straining to pierce the shadows. For a tense eternity, nothing happened. Whatever was out there was watching, waiting. Suddenly, Elena yelled, There! There was a blur of movement, a flash of ragged fur as something impossibly large lunged out of the undergrowth. Elena fired. I fired too, the gunshots shattering the tense silence. The thing let out a roar that resonated through the trees, a chilling mix of fury and pain. It staggered, then turned and bolted, crashing through the undergrowth with surprising speed. We gave chase, adrenaline coursing through our veins. But it moved like a phantom through the trees, always one step ahead, drawing us deeper into its territory. Just when we'd catch a glimpse, it would dissolve back into the shadows, leaving behind only an unsettling feeling that we were the ones being hunted. The sun was beginning to set, casting long, distorted shadows through the trees. We were losing the light. We had to turn back. Jonah, it's too dangerous, Elena said, her voice ragged. I knew she was right, but something was gnawing at me. The image of Maya's vacant-eyed stuffed rabbit lying in the mud. Just a little further, I pleaded. We have to see what we're up against. With a sigh that was either resignation or pity, she nodded. We pushed deeper into the twilight gloom of the forest, our footsteps unnaturally loud in the oppressive silence. The air felt heavy, charged with a waiting menace. Up ahead, the trees thinned, giving way to a rocky clearing bathed in the waning sunlight. And there it stood. The creature was a grotesque mockery of life, a towering giant of matted fur and impossibly long, twisted limbs. Its head was a nightmarish fusion of animal and something else, its jaw bristling with needle-like teeth. Its eyes, those terrible, burning eyes, fixed on us with a chilling, malevolent intelligence. For a heartbeat, we could only stare, our minds grappling with the impossible reality before us. Then, it moved. With a speed that defied its bulk, it lunged. I barely raised my rifle before a massive, clawed hand knocked it aside. Elena yelled and fired. The creature stumbled, letting out a roar that split the air, but it didn't falter. It swiped at her, a blow that would have eviscerated her if she hadn't rolled aside in the nick of time. I scrambled for my fallen rifle, my hand shaking. I knew with a bone-deep certainty that this wasn't a fight we could win. Run! I shouted at Elena, though some dark part of me knew it was useless. She did, sprinting back towards the tree line with the creature in pursuit. Its focus was fixed on her, a single-minded predator intent on its prey. I could have run too, but I didn't. Instead, I raised my rifle and fired again, and again, a futile attempt to distract it. Maybe it worked. Maybe it was just the cruel whimsy of the creature. But it suddenly changed course, veering away from Elena and turning its attention towards me. A flicker of relief, quickly replaced by a surge of icy dread, washed over me. At least she had a chance. The creature charged with terrifying speed. I fired one last desperate shot, more out of instinct than any real hope of stopping it. It roared, a sound of pain or rage I couldn't tell. One of its claws grazed my side, tearing my uniform and drawing a line of hot, stinging pain. I stumbled, falling to my knees and braced for the killing blow. It never came. A blur of movement, a flash of steel, and suddenly Elena was between me and the creature. I'd forgotten she always carried a survival knife, a relic from her days as a military medic. Now she held it like a warrior, her small frame radiating a fierce determination in the face of the monstrous behemoth. Run, you old fool, she yelled at me, her voice cracking with strain. This time I obeyed. I scrambled to my feet and retreated towards the forest, the sounds of snarls and shouts fading behind me. I didn't look back. I couldn't. All I could think about was Elena, buying me precious seconds with her own life. I burst out of the tree line, back into the familiar, less terrifying world of the Yosemite Trail. Reinforcements came quickly. The search team fanned out through the woods, their shouts and the clatter of gear shattering the primeval silence. I tried to guide them, to point them towards the clearing, but my voice kept breaking, and the words seemed to catch in my throat. They needed more than my broken directions. They needed proof of the monstrous thing that lurked in the forest. But Elena and the creature, they were gone. 
We searched into the night, long after hope had flickered out. In the grim dawn, we found nothing. No trace of Elena, no sign of the creature, just the faint echo of the blood-curdling roar fading into the depths of the wilderness. Officially, Elena was listed as missing, another unexplained disappearance in the vast expanse of Yosemite. The case, like that of the Turner family, eventually went cold. I retired shortly after. Couldn't stand to look at the woods the same way, the comforting familiarity replaced by a bone-deep wariness. The cabin, once my sanctuary, now felt too remote, too exposed. I sold it, moved to a small nondescript apartment in the city, desperately seeking the anonymity of crowds and the illusion of safety in numbers. Most days, the memories fade. I convinced myself it was a freak occurrence, a rogue monster, perhaps the last of its kind, now dead or moved on. But then come the nights when the woods creep into my dreams. I wake gasping for air, the echo of Elena's defiant shout and the creature's roar ringing in my ears. I see Maya's solemn face, her dark eyes filled with a wisdom no child should possess, and remember her chilling whisper, There are monsters in the woods. I still walk the city parks, pushing through the throngs of unknowing faces. I look normal, unremarkable, like any other retiree taking in the afternoon sun. But some days I catch a glimpse of darkness in the shadows between the trees, a flicker of impossible movement at the edge of my vision. And on those days I hurry my steps, seeking the crowds again, the noise, anything to drown out the terrible silence of the wild. They dismiss the stories, the disappearances, the whispered tales passed down among rangers of a creature that haunts the deepest parts of Yosemite. They rationalize, explain, and try to confine the monstrous within the boundaries of the known. Maybe they're right. Maybe it's just the ramblings of a traumatized old man, clinging to the memory of the woman who sacrificed herself for him. But deep down, in those terrible moments of twilight clarity, I know the truth. The wilderness is older and vaster than we can ever comprehend. Within its ancient depths, there are things that defy understanding, creatures that have stalked the shadows since long before human memory. And I know with chilling certainty that they're still out there. My name's Cade Warren, and this happened to me on October 17th, 2014, deep in the heart of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Been working these woods my whole life, just like my pappy before me. Knew them trails like the back of my hand. Thought nothing could surprise me anymore. Guess I was wrong about that. It began with a missing persons case. Two college kids on a weekend camping trip gone off the grid. Folks get lost up in these mountains all the time, but something about this felt different. No sign of their gear, no sign of them at all. Not a trace. Now that set off alarm bells. Started wondering if maybe some drifter or escaped con was hiding out, preying on the unwary. I was tasked with leading the search party up into the higher elevations where they'd last been seen. We went in packing heavy rifles, emergency supplies, the works. Wasn't expecting to find some Boy Scouts out for a casual hike. The woods felt heavy, air thick even for autumn. Team was on edge too, a sense that we weren't alone out there. We made camp that night in a narrow valley, intending to continue the search at daybreak. After dinner I decided to take a perimeter walk. Old ranger habits die hard, strayed a little ways from the firelight just scanning the tree line. That's when I heard it. A rustling sound, then a low guttural growl. It made the hair on the back of my neck stand on end. Wasn't no animal I recognized. Back at camp, everyone was asleep. It was probably nothing, I told myself. Probably some half-starved coyote. Yet I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. I spent the rest of the night listening to the symphony of crickets punctuated by the occasional snap of a branch, the hoot of an owl, and something else. Something that sounded far too big, far too close for comfort. The next morning broke cold and clear. We began our search again, spreading out to cover more ground. Hours passed without a sign. I found myself gravitating to the area's most overgrown, the tangled thickets of rhododendron. 
Something told me these kids hadn't wandered far from where they began. By midday, two of my team were getting jumpy. They'd heard those noises, too. Swore they saw shadows just out of sight. It wasn't their imaginations. Then, just ahead, the bushes trembled, and a massive shape burst forth. For a moment, my mind went blank. This thing was a nightmare made flesh. Standing at least nine feet tall, caked in mud and who knows what else. It was impossibly strong-looking, muscles rippling beneath a coat of thick black fur. The head was... hard to describe. Small and hunched forward, with a flat, protruding snout and tiny black eyes full of predatory cunning. It roared, bearing rows of vicious teeth, and that's when the smell hit me, like rotting meat and something altogether fouler. I shouted for the team to fall back, raising my rifle and firing off warning shots. The thing flinched, then charged forward, its speed terrifying. We fell back in disarray, firing as we went. The creature barreled forward, heedless of the gunfire. It lunged at a young ranger named Beth, its clawed hand the size of a bear trap raking across her torso. She screamed, then crumpled to the ground. Chaos then. Shots rang out and the creature let out an enraged roar. I saw it grab another ranger, Tom, and toss him aside like a broken doll. Then, as suddenly as it materialized, it was gone, vanishing into the undergrowth with impossible agility. I sprinted to Beth, the world blurring around me. Blood soaked through my hands as I tried to stop the bleeding. Her eyes stared lifelessly up at the sky. Tom's fate wasn't much better. He lay sprawled against a tree, legs mangled, neck twisted at an unnatural angle. Only one other ranger, Jensen, had escaped unscathed, his face pale with shock. The three of us were all that remained of the search party, left staring at the mangled remains of our comrades. The creature had moved off. It could be anywhere. Watching us, stalking, waiting. We radioed for backup, voices trembling. But who the hell would believe us? Ranger death, sure. Animal attack, maybe. But a hulking, unidentified monster that shrugged off gunfire? Backup came, of course. Armed support, even a chopper circling overhead. What they didn't find was the creature. They did find the bodies, the campsite ransacked, and the remnants of an animal carcass nearby, torn to bloody ribbons. They also found footprints, huge prints unlike anything in the official wildlife guides. The official report went with mountain lion attack. Easier to swallow, I suppose. Easier to avoid the media frenzy and uncomfortable questions about what else lurked out there. It didn't bring back Beth or Tom. Didn't change the fact that whatever we encountered that day wasn't natural. Wasn't simply part of the ecosystem. They told me to take leave. Said I was suffering shock. Trauma. Maybe they were right. But I couldn't sit still. Couldn't forget the creature's malevolent glare. The sickening reek of its fur couldn't forget Beth's last terrified scream. Left the mountains for a while, drifted, did odd jobs. But the nightmares followed me. Now, I'm back. Not working as a ranger anymore, at least not officially. I patrol different wilderness areas now, the sprawling forests and swamplands, chasing rumors of hunters disappearing, hikers vanishing. I leave notes, Warnings for those brave enough or foolish enough to venture into the deepest parts of the backcountry. Beware. Predator at large. Someone has to do it. Someone has to stand between the innocent and the things that lurk in the shadows. It's a lonely existence. A thankless one. And one of these days, that creature, or one of its kin, will find me again. I know that. Accept that. It's an ugly world sometimes but even the ugliest truths need to be brought to light. My pursuit became an obsession. I'd spot a story in the local papers, an unexplained disappearance in some remote corner of the country, and I'd be on the road. Each new location offered a twisted puzzle. Tracks defying identification, half-eaten animal carcasses, the lingering whispers of terrified witnesses. I'd camp alone in the woods for weeks, my senses always on high alert, waiting for the slightest hint of movement, the faintest whiff of that putrid musk in the air. I started keeping even more detailed records. I meticulously cataloged each encounter, each footprint or shredded campsite, cross-referenced the sightings, mapped likely hunting ranges. Those creatures weren't random. 
there were patterns emerging. A preference for dense, old-growth forest. A tendency to stick to the fringes of civilization. They were intelligent, adaptable, and they were becoming bolder. The obsession came at a cost. Relationships unraveled. Anyone who stuck around long enough saw the haunted look in my eyes. The way I'd jump at every creaking floorboard. My savings dwindled, replaced by a collection of worn trail boots, battered binoculars, and a shotgun that rarely left my side. Didn't matter. This was bigger than any one person. One trail led north, way up into the isolated forests along the U.S.-Canadian border. There, I befriended a wiry, weathered old trapper named Hank, one of the few who believed my outlandish tales. Hank swore he'd seen something monstrous up on the ridgeline above his cabin, something that snatched one of his traps clean off its chain, a trap that could hold a grizzly. We spent a week up in those woods, laying out extra traps, cameras, waiting for the creature to return. It did, on the fourth night. But it wasn't alone. I woke to Hank's panicked shouts and gunfire ripping through the darkness. I scrambled out of my tent, sleep-fogged and disoriented. The clearing in front of Hank's cabin was a scene of utter chaos. Hank was slumped against the porch, already gone, his chest ripped open by monstrous claws. One of the creatures, the same massive brute I remembered from the Smokies, stood over his body, blood dripping from its fangs. It turned, pinning me in the glare of those beady, malevolent eyes. A younger, smaller creature flanked it, fur dappled with Hank's fresh blood. Rage and grief ignited within me. This was personal now. I raised my rifle and fired, a desperate act of defiance. The bigger creature snarled, swiping a massive paw in my direction. I dove for cover, rolling behind the remains of Hank's woodshed. Splinters flew as the creature demolished the structure with brute force. I was pinned down, heart pounding like a war drum. Another gunshot. The younger creature cried out in pain. I risked a glance and saw it limping away into the trees, a streak of red trailing behind. One down, at least. But the larger one, the real threat, was still focused on ripping me to shreds. Hope flared when a vehicle roared up the dirt path leading to the cabin. Two figures, strangers, leaped out, armed to the teeth. They'd heard the commotion, they shouted, we're here to help. For a fleeting second, I believed salvation had arrived. But something was wrong. Their movements were jerky, awkward, their expressions fixed. Then I noticed the way their eyes gleamed in the moonlight, those same small, black, unnaturally intelligent eyes. More of those creatures, wearing human skin. I opened my mouth to shout a warning, but it was too late. The two newcomers turned their guns on me. The first shot slammed into my shoulder, sending me sprawling. Another tore through the flimsy cover of the woodshed. The hulking creature was closing in, sensing my vulnerability, relishing the kill. This was it. After all those years, all those solitary miles, it would end not with a hero's stand, but a desperate demise in this remote, blood-soaked clearing. Then, as if called from a nightmare, a new sound split the air. It started as a low rumble, rising to a deep, ground-shaking roar. Something dark and impossibly huge crashed through the tree line. The creatures, including the one closing in on me, froze, confusion replacing their bloodlust. From the shadows emerged a bear, but a bear like none I'd ever seen. Twice the size of a grizzly with a broad chest and claws the length of machetes. Its eyes blazed with not just animal fury, but a chilling, primal intelligence. It charged the creatures with a roar that rattled my bones. The bear was a blur of fur and teeth. One of the disguised creatures barely had time to raise its gun before the bear ripped it apart in a spray of blood. The other fled, scrambling for its truck. The monstrous creature that had stalked me, the killer of Beth and Tom, hesitated, then turned to face this new threat. What followed was a clash of titans. The bear and the creature tore into each other, the clearing shaking with the force of their blows. I scrambled to my feet, my wounded shoulder screaming in protest. The newcomer's truck sputtered to life, its tires spinning as it disappeared down the dirt track. I fumbled with my rifle, but the fight raged beyond my ability to intervene. This was their battle now, fought for reasons I couldn't fathom, and as quickly as it started, it was over. The creature, 
outmatched in sheer size and power, lay crumpled on the blood-soaked ground. The giant bear stood above it, breathing heavily, a fresh gash across its flank. It turned its massive head and looked directly at me. And in that moment I felt a surge of understanding. This bear, this impossibly large protector of the wilds, it was connected to those creatures in a way I didn't grasp. Part of some ancient balance I was only beginning to glimpse. The bear lumbered away, disappearing back into the trees with the same eerie silence it had appeared from. I stood there shaking, the world tilted on its axis. As dawn spilled over the clearing, I saw the damage in stark light. Hank's lifeless form, the monstrous corpses, still unsettlingly human-like. The remnants of a battle that defied understanding. The aftermath is a blur. I made the call, gave the report filled with words like, Bear attack. Unknown assailants. More lies to cover up a truth too dangerous to tell. They buried Hank and cleaned up the clearing, sanitizing the scene into something explainable, something easy to forget. I continue to wander, following the trail of blood and whispers. That battle up north changed me. Now I'm not just a hunter, but a witness to a hidden world, a world where nature itself fights back against the crawling darkness. The quest isn't about killing those creatures anymore. It's about learning, about understanding the forces at play out there. And maybe... Just maybe, finding a way for all of us, human and other, to survive together. My name is Rowan Ellis, and this happened to me in August of 2001. I was a fresh-faced rookie park ranger assigned to Sequoia National Park. You gotta love that California sunshine, right? At least that's what I thought until that fateful August day. My beat was a popular hiking trail, the Grizzly Falls Loop. Easy, well marked. The kind you took the family on while Grandpa grumbled about the heat and the kids collected suspiciously shiny rocks. Not much scope for excitement, but a new ranger can't be picky. And it got me out among those magnificent trees. That day began like any other. I did the morning patrol, chased off some teenagers trying to carve their initials into a sequoia trunk that sort of thing. On my second sweep of the trail, I came across a backpack tucked behind a bush. Someone had taken it off and forgotten it, apparently. Happens all the time. I gave it a shake, heard a rattling inside. Probably someone's stash of trail mix. Figuring I'd reunite the pack with its owner, I looked for ID. Found a half-full water bottle, a crumpled granola bar wrapper, and a woman's wallet. I took the wallet out, flipped it open, and a chill ran down my spine. Inside, instead of the usual driver's license, there was a folded note with scrawled writing. Help me, he's watching. Don't go too far from the trail, phone's dead. My first thought was a prank. Some idiot's idea of a good time spooking the tourists. The more rational part of me, the new ranger part, knew better. You don't joke about someone being in danger, not in a national park with its share of disappearances each year. Protocol kicked in, sharp and insistent inside my head. I radioed in my location and a brief description of the backpack owner, her name gleaned from the wallet. Dispatch promised to put out an alert on the missing woman. Meanwhile, I was told to stay put and wait for backup. Yeah, that wasn't going to happen. Every minute that passed could be the difference between saving someone and, well, not. With a silent apology to my superiors, I tucked the wallet back into the pack and stepped off the trail, carefully marking the spot with a couple of small stones. The woods felt different here, greener somehow, and quieter. Birdsong seemed absent. All I heard was the buzzing of insects. The underbrush was a tangle of branches and vines. Forcing my way through, I called out the woman's name. No answer. Just the rustling of leaves as I pushed ahead, and an odd, prickling sensation on my skin, like I was being watched. Suddenly, something dark zipped past a tree trunk up ahead. Too big for a squirrel. Too fast to be a deer. I stopped, heart pounding against my ribs. Logic battled with fear. Keep going was the logical call. The woman could be hurt, in need of help. But the fear, it whispered about predators, about how easily a lone ranger could disappear without a trace. I took a deep, steadying breath and went on. And then... I saw the blood. Not much, 
just a few spatters on the leaves. I froze. My pulse thrummed a frantic tattoo inside my head. I drew my gun, scanning my surroundings. Nothing. The drops led a short way off the impromptu trail I was following and... ended. No body, no struggle marks. Had the woman been wounded and dragged away? The thought made my stomach turn. Right then, I heard a noise behind me. I turned, my gun at the ready, to see... a kid. No more than six or seven years old, standing there, his face streaked with dirt and tears. But it wasn't the kid that sent a fresh jolt of horror through me. It was what loomed behind him, rising silently from the undergrowth. It was tall, at least seven feet, its body lean and impossibly long-limbed. The skin was a mottled greenish-brown, stretched tight over sinewy muscle. Its head was oddly elongated, almost snout-like, with teeth far too large for its narrow jaw. But its eyes, they were the worst. Yellow, pupilless, and filled with a chilling intelligence. The woman was right. It had been watching. The creature didn't advance immediately. It simply turned its head slightly and tilted those yellow eyes towards me. A sound rose in its throat, something halfway between a growl and a hiss. The kid, barely more than a toddler really, whimpered and clutched at his knees, burying his face against the filthy jeans. I aimed my gun. My finger trembled on the trigger. My legs were frozen to the ground, my mind a chaotic mess of predator instincts kicking in. I was outmatched physically, outgunned even if it came to that. But the kid, he was innocent, caught in the wrong place at the wrong time. I needed a distraction. Holstering my gun, I took a step back, raising my hands to show I meant no harm. My voice was shaky but clear. It's okay, buddy. I'm here to help. The creature twitched, its head tilting even further to the side as it studied me. Whether it understood my words or merely sensed less of a threat, I couldn't tell. The kid finally peeked up from behind his knees, his face a mix of fear and confusion. Easy now, I continued, my gaze locked on the creature. You want to take it slow? Just nod if you get me. Here's the deal. This thing... I struggled to find the right word. This critter doesn't like me much. I'll walk away nice and slow. You stay here for a bit, then go back to the trail and shout for help, okay? The kid didn't nod, just blinked his big, tear-filled eyes at me. But I saw the flicker of comprehension there, and that was all I needed. Step by careful step, I retreated, keeping the creature in sight. Its gaze never left me, its body tense as a coiled spring. Relief washed over me when I reached the edge of the clearing, but just as I thought I was in the clear, the unthinkable happened. The kid let out a wail, part terror, part pure grief. And then he ran, not back towards the trail, but right towards the creature. I screamed a useless warning. In the space of a heartbeat, the creature had the boy in its grasp, its long claws digging into the child's thin shirt. It hoisted him off the ground, his cries choked off by a massive, leathery hand clamping over his mouth. Pure, blinding fury erupted inside me. All thoughts of self-preservation vanished. Snatching up my gun again, I fired off a shot, then another. Both hit their mark, the creature flinching and letting out a roar of pain that rattled the leaves from the branches. Blood spattered, dark and thick. I knew even then it wasn't enough. It just made the creature angry, its yellow eyes narrowing with a chilling malice. The boy dangled limply from one monstrous hand, his face an awful shade of blue. I charged forward, heedless of danger, firing wildly as I ran. I saw the creature's mouth open wide, those oversized teeth glinting in the dim green light. I heard a snap, a sickening crunch, followed by the small body dropping to the leaf-strewn ground. I don't know how many more times I fired before the creature turned and fled, its long limbs carrying it away with surprising speed. I was on my knees beside the boy a second later, but it was too late. Too late for him. Too late for the note in the backpack pleading for help. Too late for all of it. Rescue came swiftly. The Park Service helicopter, a team of armed rangers, even an investigative reporter from one of the local news stations, the incident blew up on social media missing woman, mysterious creature sighting, dead child. 
I was questioned, scrutinized, my actions analyzed to death. Technically, I violated protocol, jeopardized myself, and caused the death of an innocent child. None of that mattered. It never would. You see, the park kept it quiet, smothered the story under a veil of plausible deniability. Bear attack, mountain lion maybe, the boy tragically got separated from his mother who was, of course, never found. It's safer that way. Better for the tourist numbers, better for everyone who wants to believe the national parks are just pristine slices of the great outdoors, untouched by real darkness. I quit my job, of course, took up a new one behind a desk, in a city where the biggest predators are made of concrete and steel. They changed the beat assignments in Sequoia, no ranger goes out solo on the Grizzly Falls Trail anymore. I still wonder sometimes if it would have made any difference. The aftermath, they call it. For me, there's no such thing. Every night I see the boy, lifeless in the creature's grasp. I hear his screams cut short. I smell the blood and the sharp, feral scent of the thing that took him. The worst part is, I know they're out there. The things that exist just beyond the well-lit paths. The things that lurk in the shadows of the ancient trees. Every rustle of leaves in the park across the street from my apartment is a threat. Every missing pet poster is a grim reminder. And most days, hidden by the din of city life, is the bone-deep certainty that someday those pupilless yellow eyes will find me. It's not the dramatic horror stories that haunt you the most, the ones with fanged monsters and blood-splattered walls. It's the simple tragedies, the quiet terrors, the ones that leave you staring at the empty silence long after the lights go out. That's the aftermath I carry every day. My name is Eli Bennett, and this happened to me in September 2016. I'm a national park ranger and have been for as long as I can remember. My dad was a ranger, and his dad before him, and it was all I ever wanted to be. Guess some things are in the blood. I work in Olympic National Park. Beautiful place, all rainforest and rugged mountains, but even the most stunning scenery can hold dark secrets. September is elk rutting season, makes for spectacular wildlife spotting, but also dangerous. Big bull elk, pumped up on hormones. They'll charge a Volkswagen if they think it stole their girl. Always got to watch those tourists, some think the whole park is a Disneyland ride, that the animals are trained to be photo props. This particular morning I was dealing with a family trying to take selfies with a particularly agitated bull elk. Finally got them back in their car and headed out to check one of the backcountry trails. When the radio call came in, it was dispatch, voice tight. Not another lost hiker or mountain bike accident, please. But this was different. Multiple park visitors, missing the dispatcher said, words clipped. Since early this morning, last known location, south end of the Ho Rainforest Trail. Well, that's not good. The Ho Rainforest is dense, old-growth trees with canopies so thick they blot out the sky. Easy to get turned around there. But this was more than folks losing the trail. It felt wrong, that prickle at the back of my neck again. I headed for the trailhead, lights flashing. A couple other rangers had already arrived, Faces grim. One was an older woman, Anya, ex-military with nerves of steel. The other, Josh, well, let's just say he was still fresh out of the academy, more used to writing parking tickets than whatever this was going to be. The missing folks were two men and a woman, experienced hikers according to their backcountry permit. That was something, at least. Anya started interviewing their friend, the one who made the call, trying to get a clearer picture of where they might have gone. I took Josh aside. Look, kid, this ain't going to be some lost puppy rescue. Stay sharp, do what I say, and keep your wits about you, I told him. Honestly, I was half hoping to scare him off, get him transferred somewhere safer. But Josh just nodded, face pale but determined. Guess he had some grit in him after all. Dispatch came through with another update. A group of day hikers heard screams further down the trail hours ago. Anya swore, low and harsh. Okay, now it felt like we were walking into a trap. We moved out, deeper into the rainforest. Sunlight barely filters through the leaves here, everything damp and shrouded in a perpetual green gloom. 
The air thrummed with insects, the smell of wet earth almost overpowering. Josh coughed and said, Kinda creepy, isn't it? You ain't seen nothing yet, I muttered. We found their abandoned campsite about an hour in. Gear tossed everywhere, like they left in a hurry. Worse, blood splatters on a torn sleeping bag. I held up a closed fist, signaling Anya and Josh to halt. The prickle on my neck had intensified, the sense of wrongness almost suffocating. Every snap of a twig, every rustle of leaves, felt like something closing in. That's when I saw the first footprint. It was massive, easily double the size of any man's foot I'd ever seen. Toes were too long, splayed out wide, and the claws... Those claws sunk deep into the mud. There were more prints leading deeper into the trees. What the hell? Josh whispered, his voice shaking. I don't know, I admitted, feeling my stomach clench. It was time for plain talk. This ain't some bear, folks. Whatever did this, it's something new. Or at least something I ain't never encountered before. Anya was staring at the ground, muttering something in Russian I didn't catch. When she looked up, her face was set in a mask of grim determination. There's old legends up here, she said, her voice low. Stories the Ho tribe used to tell. I think... She took a deep breath. I think we're about to see one of those stories come to life. The way she said it, I knew she wasn't talking fairy tales. We loaded our rifles, checked our sidearms, and followed those monstrous tracks into the heart of the wilderness. Something was out here, something brutal and hungry. The rainforest always held an air of mystery, but today that mystery felt laced with malice. Every so often we'd find a blood trail or signs of a struggle, a shredded backpack, a bent hiking pole snapped like a twig. What we didn't find were bodies. Whatever this creature was, it wasn't just leaving its victims to die. It was taking them. The sun was low by the time we began hearing it. Sounds carry strange in the forest, echoing and deceptive. At first it was a mournful wail, like a wolf, but distorted somehow, stretched too long. Then came a snapping, crashing noise, tree branches splintering against something massive. Stay together, I hissed to Anya and Josh. I gripped my rifle with white-knuckled hands, feeling adrenaline spike through my veins. Whatever this thing was, I knew one thing for sure. We were no longer the hunters. We were the prey. We rounded a bend in the overgrown trail. For a moment, the trees ahead seemed to sway and heave, then something stepped out into view. I won't forget that first sight, not if I live to be a hundred. It was the size of a grizzly, hunched forward on overlong limbs, but that's where any resemblance to nature ended. Its skin clung tight to its ribs, sickly pale, hairless in patches. Its head... It was like a human skull pulled out of proportion, a mouth unnaturally wide, filled with rows of jagged teeth. Its eyes... Those were the worst. Small, black, they glittered with a terrible, calculating intelligence. It let out another of those wails, sending chills down my spine. And that's when it saw us. In that moment, I knew. This was the thing, the source of all those old stories I thought were campfire tales. This was the thing whispered about. The thing that takes and is never seen again. The creature lunged, its speed shocking against its lumbering appearance. Josh screamed and stumbled back, firing his rifle in a panic. The shots hit. I saw the creature jerk, but it barely seemed to slow down. It crashed into Josh, hurling him to the ground with a sickening thud. I heard bone break, and then Josh was gone, swallowed into the undergrowth behind the charging beast. Josh! Anya yelled, her rifle barking. She managed to drive it back, and blood spattered the leaves, but not enough. It was too tough, too fast, and it was already circling around for another attack. That's when I saw the cave. A narrow opening in the roots of an ancient cedar half hidden by ferns. Anya, the cave, get to cover! I shouted just as the creature charged again. Anya, thank God, listened. She sprinted towards the opening, diving in at the last possible second. The creature focused on her barreled past. Its claws raked the ground where she'd been moments before. Then it turned back, snarling. I fired shot after shot, aiming for those hellish eyes, but it seemed barely affected. I kept firing, 
more to buy time than do any real damage. The clicking of my empty magazine was the loudest sound in the world. This was it. Ammo gone, Anya trapped, and that thing waiting right in front of me. I tossed the useless rifle aside and drew my pistol. Not much, but it was all I had left. The creature crouched low, muscles tensing like coiled springs. With a screech, it lunged again. I closed my eyes, finger squeezing the trigger. Then, an explosion of noise. A shotgun blast so close my ears rang. The creature shrieked, twisting midair and crashed to the ground a few feet from me. Blinded, I stumbled back, tripping over a root, expecting the killing blow any second. But it didn't come. I cracked open an eye. The creature was thrashing, but something was pinning it down. My vision cleared and I saw Anya standing over it, the smoking shotgun clutched in her hands. But what held the creature to the ground? It was Josh. He was on its back, clinging for dear life. His clothes were in tatters, one leg twisted at an impossible angle, and blood streamed from a savage scratch across his face. Yet, in his hand was my discarded rifle, and he jammed the barrel into the monster's ruined eye socket. The creature bucked and shrieked, its strength impossible, but Josh held on, driven by desperation. Shoot! He choked out. Shoot it again! That snapped me out of my shock. I scrambled up, aiming my pistol with trembling hands. I squeezed the trigger over and over, putting round after round into the creature's skull. Finally, its thrashing slowed, then stopped. It lay still, a grotesque corpse amongst the ferns. Silence fell, broken only by our ragged breathing. I looked at Josh, lying on that thing's back, and a wave of guilt and gratitude washed over me. I'd written him off, and he just saved my life. Anya moved slowly toward him, tears streaming down her face. She gently peeled his hands from the rifle, and then he slumped, unconscious. We got him stabilized as best we could, Anya radioing for an emergency airlift as I tried to stop the worst of the bleeding. All the while I kept staring at the creature's body. Whatever it was, it wasn't an animal. Not wholly. Under that hide was a warped framework of bone, like someone took half-remembered pieces and stuck them together in a grotesque mockery of life. What made that thing? And how many more were out there? The thought made me sick. The chopper arrived with the fading light. Park medics loaded Josh in, then Anya, who refused to leave his side. Before I climbed aboard, I took one last look at the clearing. The creature's body was already being consumed by the rainforest. Insects buzzed, vines snaked towards it, a carpet of moss began creeping across its skin. In a few days, there'd be no trace. Nothing for backup rangers to find but torn up ground and some half-believed story from a traumatized survivor. Aftermath. Josh didn't make it. He pulled through surgery, but then complications, infection. He was gone a few weeks later. Anya never came back to the park service, took an early retirement, and disappeared from what I heard. My report? Well, bear attack, of course. What else could I say? That we encountered some monster from a campfire story and lived only by sheer luck. They'd have locked me up in a padded room. Officially, it's like that day never happened. Josh is a name on a plaque. A ranger who died in the line of duty. The creature? Just a figment of my grief-stricken imagination. That might be easier to live with, if I believed it. But I don't. Sometimes, on patrol deep in the forest, I swear I feel eyes on me. Sometimes I hear that mournful wail echoing through the trees and I have to fight the urge to run, to hide. Sometimes I wake in a cold sweat and the air crackles with a sense of wrongness that clings to me for days afterwards. And there's one more thing. A few months after that incident, we found another body deep in the rainforest. Not a hiker. This was older. Bones half buried under the roots of an ancient tree, picked clean by scavengers. The anthropologist they brought in was baffled, said it didn't fit any creature known to walk this earth. I didn't correct him. Sometimes I wonder if they're more out there, those things. Maybe they've always been out there, hidden in the deepest shadows, preying on whoever strays too far, too deep. Maybe the stories were true all along, and the horror isn't something new. It's as old as the forest itself. All I know for sure is this. The wilderness ain't the safe haven some folks think. There's teeth in those woods, claws, and eyes that watch from the darkness. And if you ain't careful, if you don't believe in monsters... 
They'll make a believer out of you yet. My name is David Carter, and this happened to me in September of 1997. Back then, I was just another Greenhorn Ranger stationed in Glacier National Park. Montana wilderness, beautiful, brutal, and deceptively large. You think you know mountains until they stretch out in every direction, a sea of green and gray peaks hiding God knows what. I grew up in Colorado, so I'm no stranger to rough terrain. But there's something different about Glacier. Something old. Like the land itself remembers things we've long forgotten. That thought should have set my teeth on edge, a warning bell ignored. But when you're young, you figure you're invincible, even out here. My partner was Allison, a tough, seasoned ranger with the weathered face of someone twice her age. She was showing me the ropes, and I was starting to enjoy the solitary patrols, the chance to clear my head after a stint in the Marines. Late one afternoon, just as the sun was starting to dip behind the mountains, we got called out to a remote section of the park near the Canadian border. Couple of hikers hadn't checked back in as planned. Routine stuff, most likely just overly cautious family blowing things out of proportion. We reach the trailhead and start our hike in. The trail winds up a heavily forested slope, the kind of place where the shadows deepen way before sunset. Allison's setting a brisk pace. She's the serious type, all business, while I'm still prone to cracking a stupid joke to break the tension. So, boss, I ask, think those tourists got lost, or think they found Bigfoot? She doesn't even crack a smile. Found themselves in more trouble than they counted on, probably. City folk don't respect the woods. Typical Allison. But as we trek deeper into the trees, a trickle of unease starts gnawing at me. The woods feel... empty. I'm used to the sounds of animals, rustling of birds in the leaves, the chirp of insects... None of that here. Just silence, pressing down on us like a blanket. Suddenly, Allison stops and holds up a fist. I go still. She points off into the trees, her voice barely a whisper. Over there. See it? Took me a moment, peering through the dense foliage, but then I see it. A flash of movement, unnaturally quick. And something about the shape, wrong. Too tall, too lean. Definitely not a bear or a mountain lion. Before I can even process it, the thing steps into view on the trail ahead, not twenty yards from us. I freeze. It's like nothing I've ever seen before. Humanoid, but stretched and gaunt like a half-starved animal. Its skin has a strange, mottled gray tone, almost translucent in places, so you can see the bones beneath. Its eyes... That's what makes me gasp aloud. Black like marbles, no whites, just an endless hungry void. It stands there utterly still, head tilted like it's studying us. I fumble for my radio, but Allison grabs my wrist, her fingers like a steel clamp. Don't, she hisses. Don't make any sudden moves. The creature lets out a clicking sound, high-pitched, almost like an insect. Then with a lurching movement that sends my heart pounding, it charges. Allison and I take off into the trees, scrambling up a steep slope that flanks the trail. We can hear it crashing through the undergrowth below, snarling and snapping in a way that raises the hair on my arms. We keep running, stumbling over rocks and exposed roots, lungs burning. From below, something crashes against a tree trunk with bone-jarring force. I don't look back. I don't need to. Finally, we burst into a clearing and collapse, gasping for air. Night has fallen. The only light is the sliver of moon cutting through the trees. I reach for my radio, hands shaking as I press the button. Static answers me. I try again. Nothing. Allison's beside me, scanning the tree line. We need to find higher ground, she says tightly. Somewhere this thing can't reach us. There's an outcropping of rock, jagged and uneven, jutting out above us. We scramble towards it, the ascent a nightmare of sharp cuts and slippery moss. Once we reach the top, I collapse again, chest heaving. Allison's already at the edge, peering down into the darkness. Damn, she swears under her breath. 
I don't see it, but it must be close. It knows we're up here. Fear turns my stomach to ice. What do we do? She doesn't reply, just pulls a flare gun from her belt, then turns towards me, expression grim. I'm going to distract it. You need to find help. Get word out about this... thing. Find another ranger, anyone. Tell them... She pauses, takes a steadying breath. Tell them Allison says there's a Code 7 in Sector 3. Before I can protest, she lets the flare loose. It bursts red and bright, illuminating the clearing below. And there it is. The creature crouched on its haunches, blinking in the sudden light. It lets out a screech that pierces the night as Allison raises the flare gun again. Go! she yells. I don't need telling twice. I scramble away from the cliff edge, stumbling through dense brush back the way we came. I can hear Allison behind me shouting, and another flare fires, casting long, flickering shadows over the tree trunks. Then comes a scream, cut brutally short. The echo of that scream propelled me through the woods. I ran blindly, branches whipping at my face, tears mixing with the cold sweat on my brow. I stumbled, fell, got back up, always with the image of Allison and those empty black eyes burned into my mind. Finally, I burst onto the main trail. My radio was still useless. Damn thing must have got busted in the fall. I had no idea how far I'd run, or where the nearest ranger station was, just that I had to get help, get reinforcements, do something, anything, for Allison. As I ran, a new sound cut through the panicked pounding of my pulse. An engine. Then I saw them, headlights cutting through the gloom, a jeep coming up the trail. I staggered into the middle of the road, waving my arms frantically. The jeep screeched to a halt. Two rangers jump out, expressions a mix of alarm and confusion. They know me, luckily, and my uniform, though torn and mud-splattered, gives my frantic words added weight. I blurt out the whole story. The missing hikers, the creature, Allison. I can see that they don't fully believe me, not at first. But there's enough doubt, enough training kicking in, to make them radio for backup. We pile into the jeep and head back into the woods where I left Allison. The clearing is a scene of devastation. The ground is churned up, dotted with dark splashes of blood. My blood runs cold. Too much blood. Broken branches litter the area, some scored with deep gouges. No sign of the creature. No sign of... Someone shouts my name. Another ranger, a veteran named Jack, is crouched near the cliff base. I race over, heart hammering. Allison is sprawled on the ground, eyes wide open, staring sightlessly at the sky. Her body is twisted in a way that makes me want to vomit. Jack shakes his head, his voice low and grim. She's gone, Carter. The rest of the night is a blur. The search for the creature, fruitless. The questions, endless. The transport of Allison's body back to the station. I stumble through it all in a daze, a gnawing guilt clawing at my insides. If only I hadn't suggested that damn hike. If only I'd been faster, stronger. They let me see her one last time, back at the station. She's laid out on a cold metal table, cleaned up, but the horrific injuries are impossible to disguise. I hold her hand. It's icy, the touch sending a shiver through me that has nothing to do with the room's temperature. Finally, I lean down and whisper in her ear. Code 7 in Sector 3, Allison. I told them. The next day, they ship me back to headquarters, cite the trauma, and strongly suggest I take a long leave, maybe even consider a different career path. I don't argue. I know what they think. Shell-shocked kid hallucinating monsters in the woods. But I also know what I saw, and what I lost. They scrubbed all records of the incident, of course. Officially, Allison and those hikers simply vanished. Search parties went out for months, found nothing. They called them tragic accidents, unlucky victims of the wild. The easy explanation, the one that lets people sleep soundly, forgetting that darkness can hide in the places we think we know. Weeks turn into months, then years. I never went back to being a ranger, couldn't bear the sight of those woods that took Allison. I drifted, odd jobs, different cities, trying to bury the past. Didn't work. The creature haunted my dreams, its clicking and screeches waking me in a cold sweat. One restless night I stumbled across an internet forum, 
a dark corner of the web where people posted stories of strange encounters, of things unseen. Hesitantly, I shared my own story, keeping the location vague, omitting identifying details. The responses came, some dismissive, others intrigued, and a few, a chilling few, from people who claimed to have seen something eerily similar in other parks, other remote places, sightings from across the country, spanning years, and always the same pattern, vanishings, mangled bodies, an unnatural predator that evaded capture. That's when the obsession began. I devoured every scrap of information I could find, grainy photographs of unidentifiable figures lurking just outside the camera's range, fragmented Native American legends that whispered of shadow creatures, cautionary tales about those who ventured off the trails and were never seen again. I started cross-referencing the sightings. They followed a rough pattern. National parks mostly, but isolated, less traveled ones. The victims were almost always those who strayed from the beaten path, seasoned hikers, off-duty rangers, the foolhardy and those who simply had rotten luck. The why kept me up at night. Hunger alone didn't seem to explain it. There was something almost playful in the creature's cruelty, like a cat torturing a mouse. I found myself wondering if it was intelligent, in some twisted way, if it was enjoying these hunts. I bought the gear-high powered rifle, night vision goggles, enough supplies to survive out in the wilderness for months. I learned to track, learned how to move silently through the woods, learned every scrap of wilderness survival I could get my hands on. In my darker moments, I wondered if I was simply going mad, driven by grief and a thirst for revenge that I knew would never be fulfilled. Then came the call. From a park ranger in New Mexico, a woman who had read one of my posts and recognized the description too well. I booked a flight the next day. It's been five years since then. I'm a ghost now, moving from place to place, following the creature's trail of mangled bodies. The official records say wild animal attacks, freak accidents, the missing simply lost. But I leave a note behind at each ranger station I pass through. One word, a grim warning to those few who might understand. Code 7. I never sleep in the same spot twice. Haven't had a conversation longer than a few minutes with another human being in years. Solitary isn't the same as lonely, I tell myself. But some nights, when the wind whistles through the trees and the shadows seem to shift and stretch in impossible ways, I wonder if I've lost the best part of myself along with Allison. The hunt never ends. Always the same pattern. I arrive too late, find the remnants, try to piece together the creature's movements and follow. Maybe someday I'll catch up with it. Maybe someday I'll have a clear shot, a bullet through that monstrous skull. Or maybe I'll simply vanish. One more victim claimed by the darkness. One more name added to the tally of missing persons. Either way, there's no other life for me now. No other path to walk.